Hi, hi everyone. Good morning. I'm Sharu. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at University of California, Los Angeles. Today, uh, my talk is on uh, ultra-fast stiffening concentrated thermoresponsive suspensions for additive manufacturing. Uh, I'll start giving you a small uh, brief background. Uh, as you know, slurry-based additive manufacturing or concrete 3D printing is getting more and more popular these days because of the growing demand for geometrically complex structural components and also due to the general trend towards free prefabrication of the structural components. Now, the central issue with the central issue that impedes the implementation of layer-wise concrete 3D printing for building geometrically complex structures is the slow and difficult to control stiffening of the printing slurry once it is deposited. So when we talk about 3D printing, say 3D printing using uh, polymeric materials, we can build almost any conceivable structure using polymer materials because the extruded material hardens uh, uh, rapidly upon extrusion. Now, while well, coming to concrete-based uh, material, the slow fluid to solid transition uh, that uh, restricts the, the print speed or the print height and the maximum possible overhang, maximum possible overhang in the structures. So this in turn uh, restricts the, the, the palette of printable geometry, especially uh, of spatially inclined members limiting the achievable arc structures that we can make using 3D printing. Now, suppose, just to give an example, suppose if you want to print a, 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 a hollow corn structure like this, say we need to print two corns of two different angles. We, we may be easily able to print the structure of this angle, but if we need to print a very small corn angle like this, so how do we print this? We print a layer over layer by printing a, uh, circles or the layer of uh, circle and then printing another layer. So if you want to print it at this con angle, we may need to achieve a higher uh, overhang. So either we most probably won't be able to print this using concrete material, or if we need to print, we need to we need to print extremely slow because before we printing the next layer, the initially printed layer should uh, attain sufficient strength. So we may not be able to exceed a threshold overhang value, or if you exceed, then the structure may collapse. So th that, that's the limitation with concrete 3D printing. And so, so for example, if you take any structure of uh, a topologically optimized structure, this is just an estimation of what are the angles, what are the uh, elements that we can print and what we cannot print. The, it's the color, the structures which shown in blue color, which may not be able to print while assuming a 10% overhang, that's what uh, possible with this material. Now, this the slurry based concrete printing, uh, which needs innovation in terms of printing methodology and the material processing. Our ultimate objective is to expand the design and the production space accessible for concrete 3D printing and explore the technology beyond what is being done to build structures that cannot be built or fabricated otherwise using conventional 3D printing. Now to, to, uh, to truly exploit the, the opportunities unlocked by the concrete 3D printing, it is essential to develop a printable composition that can undergo undergo stiffening uh, in a manner of seconds to minute, uh, thereby changing the changing into a pseudo solid, which can uh, bear its own weight and the weight of the layers, which is being printed over that. So if we can, if we have a print, uh, slurry that engineered to trigger a controllable rapid stiffening, that can be used to print a higher overhangs and improved print height and a, print, a, a better print fidelity, and improve print height at a much faster rate. That's very important. Now, our ultimate objective is to print topologically optimized structures and lattice structures and architected structures using uh, uh, additive manufacturing because this offers a high strength to weight ratio. And more importantly, if we can uh, 
if we can achieve a controllable ultra fast stiffening uh, in some slurries, it would open up an another huge possibility of freestyle printing. Freestyle printing is a methodology to fabricate structures by extruding material in a 3D space, uh, something like this. Three, uh, it can extrude a material from the in the 3D space from a base uh, along a predefined uh, path of a predefined curve. Now, freestyle 3D printing requires special hard, hardware and software capabilities and a, a different pre-processing method. This the controllable rapid stiffening material will definitely help us to explore the possibilities of concrete 3D printing uh, beyond what is being done now. With that in mind, how can we achieve this controllable rapid stiffening? What is being currently for concrete or any cementitious materials is uh, using either a fast sitting cement or set accelerators or set on demand. That, that's what is being used in 3D printing to achieve a rapid stiffening. But to get a controllable rapid stiffening uh, completely relying exclusively on the hydration of the cement, that remains uh, challenging if you want to achieve a, a very rapid stiffening. Now, what is alternative? Now, the approach that we are proposing here is incorporating a, a, a secondary binder material in the concrete or the mineral slurry. So this secondary binder material uh, can trigger an ultra fast or rapid stiffening upon such some external trigger such as a thermal trigger, an ultrasound trigger, or an electrochemical trigger. Now, that external trigger, we should be able to achieve an uh, ultra fast stiffening once we activate the secondary binder material, which is included in this cementitious mixture. So we need to, if we properly design this composition, we will have a, a precise control over the rapid uh, and the stiffening rate, the induction period, and the mechanical strength of the printed component. So we have been looking into various compositions to achieve this particular uh, capability in the printing study. So we came up with one such formulation, which is based on a thermoresponsive printing slurry. Here, we incorporated a uh, thermo, thermo setting resins into the mineral suspensions. So this is a secondary binder. So the total, uh, total uh, printing slurry consists of a thermo setting resin, a curing agent, and a large volume of the mineral, either minerals or a cement in or ordinary Portland cement. So this can be activated using the using heat as an external trigger. So when we heat it, so the the, the methodology is that we prepare that we design the thermoresponsive suspensions, which is having thermosetting resin, curing agent, and a large volume of soil, uh, solids. And then we heat it just before printing it. So probably we can have a single stage heating at the nozzle or a multiple stage heating through the extrude, uh, throughout the extruder. Now, once it is ex uh, heated, I mean, once it is reaches the critical temperature, we will we could uh, uh, induce a rapid stiffening. And once it is printed, we can then post cure it to further strengthen the component. That's the approach. Now, to achieve this, we should, uh, the, the resins that we use should meet certain uh, prerequisite uh, criteria. It should be either water soluble or water dispersible. It should be stable in highly alkaline conditions if you are using in a, in a cementitious mixture. And this should be the, the, the thermal response should be easily tunable depending upon the structure that we are going to print. And it should be thermally latent. It should only start stiffening when we want it. So it should have a proper, we should have a proper control of uh, this thermal stiffening. And the activation temperature should not be too high because we need to heat it, heat the material like within a few seconds or within a minute. And so we should have a relatively low uh, activation temperature. And once it reaches the activation temperature, it should have a fast reaction kinetics. So that are the criteria that we are looking in the resins that we need to use in these formulations. 
So what we finally want is something like this. Our suspensions, it should be thermally latent. So we should be able to easily pump it, store it just before printing. And once it reaches the nozzle, just before printing, we should be able to uh, activate it thermally. And we should, we should be able to see a rapid increase in the, the modulus and the viscosity of these suspensions. And so this can be achieved through different uh, thermosetting formulations like epoxy amine, epoxy thiol, or polyisocyanates. So what we focused here is an epoxy thiol uh, uh, formulations. So we used an amine catalyzed uh, epoxy thiol uh, reactions. So epoxy thiol reactions are, a click, are click reactions. So we have, we selected this because we have a proper control on the formulation. We'll be able to vary the activation temperature, the mechanical strength of the component that is printed. So this particular formulation allows us a proper control over the formulation. So we'll be able to vary the thiol to epoxy mixing ratio. So epoxy is the thermosetting resin here. Thiol is the, the cross linking agent. So varying this ratio, we'll be able to vary the strength of the, the component that is printed by varying the initiator type. Initiator is, an, uh, is the nucleophile, nucleophile which activates the reaction. By varying the type of this, we'll be able to change the activation temperature. By varying the type as well as the dosage, we'll be able to vary the activation temperature. So this particular formulation gives us a proper control over the, the design formulation. Now I'll quickly take you through a few results that we achieved using these formulations. So we tried this over different minerals like quartz, calcite, and portlandite, and, and a mixture of these suspensions. So just to uh, show you an example, this is a, a, a mixture where we have 10% of resins included. 10% mean 10% of the total solids in the mixture. So this is a suspension of varying uh, solid content like 0 0.4, 0 0.45, and 0 0.6. So, and 10% of that is a thermosetting resin. So you can see once it reaches the activation temperature somewhere around 70, we could achieve a very rapid stiffening as compared to suspension where there is no these resins included. So what happens is once we reach that activation temperature, the cross-linking reaction, the epoxy thiol cross condensation polymerization reaction starts. This, this graph clearly shows this one-to-one -one relation which shows on the right side, on the left side, it's the storage modulus evolution. And on the, on the right side is the epoxy cure conversion. So depending upon how, how fast is the cure conversion happening, we, we get a, a, a consequent increase in the storage modulus and the viscosity of these suspensions. So we worked on this formulation further and tried to optimize different formulation parameters. We have different formulation parameters like solid volume fraction in the suspension, the total resin content, and the initiate, initiator content that is used in the suspension, and the epoxy thiol mixing ratio. As you can see, uh, the solid content is a, uh, a, a one most critical parameter. Based on that, we'll be able to vary the stiffening rate and the activation temperature. This is not because of anything uh, which affects the curing reaction as it is. Curing reaction is uh, independent of the solid content, as you can see here. This is an uh, DSC thermogram. As uh, so, but we get a uh, relatively lower stiffening temperature and a faster stiffening rate. This is because of the crowding in the suspension. And coming to the influence of the resin dosage. Resin dosage again is the weight percentage of the total solid in the suspension. So when we have more and more resin in the suspension, we get a much faster, much more thermally responsive suspension. And another important uh, formulation parameter is the epoxy thiol mixing ratio. As you can see here, when we have an excess epoxy in the suspension, epoxy, excess epoxy in the suspension, we get a stronger and a stronger and stronger printed component. The flexural strength almost doubles when we change the thiol to epoxy mixing ratio from 1.5 to 0.5. And at the same time, we are uh, compromising on the flexural strain capacity. So if we have excess uh, epoxy, the strain capacity is relatively lower. 
Whereas when we have an uh, stoichiometric mixture of thiol thiol and epoxy, we get a, <clears throat> we get a very uh, flexible uh, printed component. And depending upon the resin dosage, we'll be able to get a higher uh, flexure tolerance. If we have more resin, we'll be having components which is having high flexural strength. If we have more and more solid, still we'll be able to get a higher flexural strength. And the more important thing is we are able to get a flexural strength which is more than 10 megapascal. And another important thing is the, the thermal latency. So we don't want the, re, the mixture to react when, uh, when we mix. So we want to re activate the reaction only when we need it. So, so this particular shows, uh, particular image shows how the, the initiator content uh, controls the activation temperature. So when we have more and more initiator, the activation temperature decreases. So depending upon the type of geometry that we need to print, we can have uh, we can carefully choose the initiator content. This particular plot over the uh, the bottom which shows the thermal latency, which shows the storage modulus evolution at uh, at room temperature, depending on uh, the initiator content. So when we have a higher initiator content, it shows a relatively faster stiffening at room temperature. So that means we have a compromised thermal latency. So Overall, we'll be able to control all the uh, the thermoresponsive characteristics as well as the post printed characteristic depending on these formulation parameter. So this particular plot shows the a, a, a complete guide design guidelines of how we should formulate the suspension. So depending upon the solid uh, volume fraction and the resin dosage, we have a recommended uh, printing domain. If we have too much solid content, we may not be able to extrude this, it, it causes jamming. If you have very less solid content, we end up with a uh, high, highly porous structure, which is not mechanically strong. And regarding the uh, resin dosage, if you have very low resin dosage, we may not be getting good thermoresponsiveness. And if you have higher resin dosage, we'll get a good thermoresponse, but it increases the cost, cost of the material. And within this thermal, uh, Within this recommended printing domain, we have different parameters which can be controlled to attain what we uh, ideally need or what is an ideal or optimal printing condition. So depending upon the solid volume fraction, our stiffening rate and flexural strength increases, but extrudability decreases. Depending on resin dosage, we get a higher stiffening rate, but the material cost increases, even though the flexural strength and the, the stiffening rate increases. And the mixing ratio, with increase in the mixing ratio, we get a higher stiffening rate, but the flexural strength decreases. And the initiator dosage, higher initiator dosage, lower, lower stiffening or lower activation temperature and faster stiffening rate, but it leads to a uh, compromised thermal latency. So the conclusion, we are still uh, working on this formulation to actually print the structures. But these stimuli uh, responsive suspensions, we believe it can uh, overcome the limitations of concrete 3D printing and expand the design and production space that is now accessible by 3D printing, uh, concrete 3D printing. And this approach is compatible and economical and scalable for any construction components. And with this particular formulation, we have a, a precise control over the pre and the post printed uh, material properties. And that's all. Uh, thank you for listening and happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks.